Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Falk. I'm the legal director of the ACLU of Indiana. And I, uh, along with Gavin Rose and Jan Mensch, uh, attorneys with the ACLU of Indiana, filed this morning a lawsuit challenging a House Enrolled Act number 1337. Uh, copies of the lawsuit are available, I believe, uh, as is a press release sort of summarizing the lawsuit. Uh, the thing I'd like to point out first concerning this litigation, which has been assigned, by the way, to Judge uh, Tanya Walton Pratt in federal court in Indianapolis, is that this statute does something that the United States Supreme Court has said repeatedly cannot be done. It is an attempt by the state of Indiana to interfere with and absolutely and ap actually prohibit a woman's right to determine whether or not to have uh, an abortion. Uh, that is a right that the United States Supreme Court has stressed that a woman absolutely has and cannot be interfered with and certainly not prohibited by the state uh, in the first trimester. Uh, of a pregnancy, and uh, the legislature and the governor have attempted to do exactly that by creating a statute which sets out reasons that women cannot get prohibition, cannot get abortions, um, the, and the state simply does not have that right, does not have that authority, and it is a gross interference with a fundamental constitutional right of privacy that all women have. The state has compounded its error in the statute by requiring clinics like Planned Parenthood, its staff, to mouth an quote-unquote informed consent requirement or language that requires Planned Parenthood to tell women, the women who have come to Planned Parenthood to be served, to tell them that they cannot get an abortion for these specific reasons. Therefore, we are challenging this statute as an as violating the fundamental right of privacy of women, imposing uh, an undue burden is the parlance, but obviously here we're talking about an absolute prohibition. And we're challenging the fact that Planned Parenthood and its employees have become the mouthpieces for spewing this unconstitutional script. So we're claiming a violation of the First Amendment and the fundamental rights of privacy inherent here. The case uh, has been filed today. The statute here is not going to effect to July 1st. We will be in the immediate future asking for a preliminary injunction and hope to have a preliminary injunction hearing long before July 1st so that the statute can be enjoined and never go into effect. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Um, I would just follow up by saying a few things. Um, obviously, Planned Parenthood is here and exists to provide health care to Hoosier women and men and families across the state of Indiana in a non-judgmental environment that is safe and private. And I would remind everybody that um, we don't support discrimination of any kind under any circumstance. We, um, we're already here in Indiana, one of four states that's listed as most hostile toward women exercising their rights to reproductive justice. We find this law abysmal, it is intrusive, it is dangerous, it is failed public health policy. It raises more questions than answers, and it's clearly going to be one of those circumstances of, of a law of unintended consequences. So Governor Pence's signature demonstrates an alarming lack of respect for women. It clearly indicates that he doesn't believe that Hoosier women should be trusted to make their own personal and private health care decisions. And it's apparently the case as well that he doesn't trust women's doctors. The leading experts on reproductive health care here in this country, which is the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, sent a letter to Governor Pence asking him very strongly to veto the legislation and of course that fell on deaf ears because here in Indiana we have a governor who finds his own personal views on these things and his own personal ideology more important than, than good public health policy and constitutional behavior. So what needs to be made abundantly clear is that what this is really about is making abortion go away entirely. It has nothing to do with doing better for who's your families and has nothing to do with serving women and making sure that they have the health care that they need. 
The law does not value life. It values birth. It does nothing to give the woman and her family any sort of support if, if in fact, there is a developmentally challenged uh, family member. And one of the things I think everybody needs to understand with great importance is that there actually was an amendment heard <coughs> with this legislation suggesting that there needed, if this law were to pass, that Indiana needed to put additional resources into supporting the families who already exist out there who don't have the support that they need for that very challenging circumstance. And needless to say, that amendment was voted down along party lines. And when we have a governor who is always talking to us about the surplus, um, I didn't notice that he put any additional resources into serving these families who are already here dealing with the challenges, let alone those who would, who would um, have them occur. And I also want to point out that when Frank O'Bannon was governor, there was an unprecedented um, uh, move to use tobacco cessation funds, and the governor put $60 million into community-based services in 2002. And that's the sort of leadership that we're looking for we're not looking for this kind of intrusion into, into very p private health care decisions. So we're concerned as well that last year we had RIFRA, and that has been a, a national embarrassment. And 364 days later, Governor Pitts signs into law 1337, and I'm assuming you've noticed that that's getting national attention as well, um, more by the day. And so you, you have to wonder if we're the states that's supposed to be um, out there supporting Hoosier hospitality, how can you argue that it's a welcome environment if this kind of legislation gets passed and signed and becomes law that shows that kind of disrespect for 51% of Indiana's population represented by the female gender? So. The last thing that I would say is it's time for Governor Pence to get out of our doctor's offices and stay out of our doctor's offices. Thank you. Uh, Ken, Betty, one of the things that we remember some of the floor debate that took place, some of the supporters of this legislation said that it was to, you know, I guess sort of, you know, protect, you know, fetuses, the unborn, give them some of the same protections as uh, I guess we do here, whether it's race, gender, disability. Have courts, have, have any other states tried to do this? And what has been like the, the legal result? The, um, there is, I believe, one other state which currently has uh, some sort of requirement like this. Uh, that has not, there's not been a substantive challenge to that. I think Illinois tried to do this years ago. And uh, after litigation, there was an agreement to strike that part of the statute. The problem is, as I, as I said in my introduction, the Supreme Court has said that there cannot be an undue burden placed on a woman's right to an abortion. That's, that's the current law. This is not an undue burden. This is an absolute prohibition. Um, you just can't do that. Uh, you cannot, and it always strikes me as odd when you have legislative uh, leaders and legislative bodies that know what the law is. I mean, everyone knows what the law is. Everyone knows that you cannot prohibit abortion, but yet we still have a piece of legislation that that explicitly prohibits abortion under certain circumstances. That simply, uh, as I said, violates the right to privacy that's been recognized since 1973. Betty, you mentioned consequences. What do you think the consequences of this law will be if it becomes law in the middle of the summer it's supposed to be? Well, there's, a, there, there's such a, a, a broad and I would fear probably vague response to that because um, a, as this legislation was moving through the legislative review process, there really wasn't anybody anywhere, including the authors, who could tell you exactly what the language said and what its implications would be. And so there's that fear that when this omnibus anti choice legislation goes into effect um, on July 1 if we're not successful in court, that all kinds of things could occur, um, both from the cremation and interment 
process that's in the law, and of course this ban. Um. Betty, Mike Fisher in Indiana Right to Life just issued a statement. He says that uh, Planned Parenthood opposes any common sense law that protects women and children because they want to protect their bottom line. React to that. It's a pretty consistent statement from the Indiana Right to Life, frankly. Um, as always, I just really wish that they would um, step up and help in circumstances where they think that there needs to be this kind of ban in, in a law in Indiana, and yet they do absolutely nothing to ensure that, that those babies and children and, and adults here in Indiana are cared for as they need to be cared for. They, they, they uh, talk about our mission with a great deal of, um, of misrepresentation. And, the, and, the, and, and they're, they're pretty toxic about it. I'm sorry. But the other thing to stress, uh, however, this isn't a debate. This is, you know, and I, I hate to sound like a lawyer, but it sort of goes with the job. <laughs> this is the law. The Supreme Court has said you cannot, cannot <coughs> prohibit a woman's right to obtain an abortion. You cannot invade a woman's right to privacy. You simply cannot do it. And the state has done precisely that which the law since 1973 firmly establishes they cannot do. So I, I, would, um, I would urge us not to cast this in terms of a debate. Uh, this, is, this is a settled legal point that for some reason the Indiana General Assembly ignored. And having said that, how confident are you <coughs> moving forward saying that it's the law and how big is this to both of you? How big is this? Um, I, I can't answer how big something is, and I can't tell you how confident I am because I, I don't predict the future. If I did, I would do something other than be a lawyer. Uh, I can tell you, though, that what the Supreme Court has said, I can tell you what the law is concerning uh, abortion, the right to obtain abortion, the inability of the state to invade this area of privacy, and I think that's pretty clear. So we'll have to see how it plays out. Obviously, Ken, you can't predict the future, but you know, using those sort of past performance as an indication of future earnings, what has your track record been with the state in this area and other uh, abortion legislation? Remember sort of the defunding that happened a few years ago, maybe some other restrictions, anti-choice. What's the track record been? I'd say it's job security on that front is pretty good. <laughs> we have been successful in combating various attempts in this area. Uh, this is a new attempt. It's a different attempt. It's, it's a different case. However, as I said, and as the fact that Indiana is virtually unique in doing this, I think demonstrates that Indiana has gone much further than the gray area uh, in, this, in this area of law. I think we're in an area that, that the Supreme Court has pretty well established where the state cannot go. But we'll see. And we don't file frivolous lawsuits. Um, they're a huge distraction, and it will cost Indiana taxpayers hundreds of thousands of dollars before this is done. Betty, same question to you. How big is this fight for Planned Parenthood of Indiana and Kentucky, and how confident are you in your position? Um, I'm sleeping reasonably well at night at this point. Um, I would say that that it is a very, very significant um, legal um, uh, initiative and, and its implications are, are they're national. And of course, um, there, is a, there is that impetus that abortion become illegal again in this country. Um, there's a, they, they, they like to overlook that, that it was doctors who stood in front of the Supreme Court justices and said, please, Stop, stop the deaths, stop the dying, um, stop the back alley abortions and make this a safe and legal and private undertaking for women in this country. And um, so, and, and it's the first challenge of its kind, I do believe.